One of the great things that the Book of Mormon does is open the meaning of the Bible in more than one way. And tonight we want to discuss one of the real challenging, in some ways, one of the real challenging ways in which this does. But I'm going to rely on the statement of the Prophet Joseph Smith as we talk about the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is the plainest book God ever caused to be written. I put my hand on the sacred scriptures, I raise my hand to the square, and I bear you my testimony. That is a true statement. Now, many of you <coughs> may want to believe, <coughs> but still may not. But I hope in some measure we can open some doors. And if there's credit for that, <coughs> it comes from the Book of Mormon, from the Prophet Joseph Smith, and uh, from the Lord in his help, which I freely and humbly acknowledge. Let me, in order to approach this subject, get back and get the foundation. Some of you people haven't uh, been here prior to this, and so I need then to go back to 1 Nephi 14. <coughs> and on the basis then of 1 Nephi 14, we have foundation to understand the book of Revelation. And I want you to get that in your mind, open your hearts and your souls, because that verily is true. Now, in 1 Nephi 14, <clears throat> Nephi sees these two great churches, the church of the mother of abominations, which is the whore of all the earth. And then he sees the Church of the Lamb of God, and that Church of the Lamb is though constitutes those Latter-day Saints who come up in adversity, purify their lives, and realize the blessings that Nephi talks about when he said, uh, I beheld that the uh, saints were armed with righteousness and with the power of God in great glory. Now, that's the Church of the Lamb the spiritually endowed church. So he sees then that these two churches exist, and this, this brings it down to our time, because there's never a period in this dispensation when you have a situation where the church of the Lord, the true church of Jesus Christ, is planted in all the major nations of the Gentiles. You don't have that, and you haven't had that until post-World War II days when, with the administration of President McKay, we began to be an international organization. And so this prophecy focuses then on our time and on future events from our time. And Nephi sees then that the mother of abominations gathered multitudes from among the Gentiles primarily to fight against God. And it came to pass that Nephi then said when this took place, as he saw all these churches throughout the world built up these stakes and these wards, that he then said, I beheld the power of God, that it descended upon the saints to the church of the Lamb and upon the covenant people of the Lord. And this has particular reference to the converted Jews who will one day receive it and flee to Jerusalem. Uh, not that all Jews will be converted, but there will be those who do. And the major nation of of the Jews will not. But then he says that the power of God in great glory uh, rests upon them, and they were armed with righteousness and with the power of God. And then he sees the preparatory work that the Lord does to establish Zion, and that preparatory work is a cleansing work, and that cleansing work is a work of cleansing among the Latter-day Saints and of this land of Zion. And so he sees then when the power of God rests upon the saints, then that there will be wars and rumors of wars among all nations. And this includes our beloved America. And he says now, when the day cometh, verse 17, that uh, wrath of God is poured out upon of the mother of harlots, which is the great and the bondable church of all the earth and so forth, whose foundation is the devil. Then at that day, that's a point of reference, that's telling us a time and what will happen. Then at that day, 
The work of the Father should commence in preparing the way for the fulfilling of his covenants, which he hath made to his people who are the house of Israel. Now this is not the day of Israel's gathering, of Israel's redemption. Note, he says, this is the day when the Father shall commence in preparing the way. This is a preparatory situation and action, and it's, and it's carried out in connection with this warfare that's poured out upon all nations. The preparatory program is one that is fulfilled through warfare. That's what he's saying. And it's going to be preparatory then to the work of preparing, of, of, uh, of fulfilling his covenants, which he has made to his people who are the house of Israel. Now, there are two things that are necessary primarily to prepare. One is we need a Zion people. We need people then who are truly Zion in the sense that they become sanctified, that they are truly a consecrated people, that they live in tune with the Holy Spirit, and that the Holy Spirit brings them to a free and open union where they see eye to eye, as the prophet says they will do when he brings again Zion. See? Now, that kind of preparation will take judgment. As Isaiah says in chapter 1 of Isaiah, Zion shall be redeemed with judgment and her converts with righteousness. Now, that's the key then. Now, the other part of the preparation is the cleansing of this land. Now, that preparation can take place either of one or two ways. It can take place by the repentance of the Gentiles, and they're embracing the gospel and freely building up the new Jerusalem. But if this doesn't happen, then when the Gentiles turn into iniquity and the cup of iniquity is full, then the Lord indicates as he has said in his great promise of this land, that this is the, the land of Zion, and that it will be a free people as long as you serve the God of the land, who is Jesus Christ. But if we don't, then, when they are ripe in iniquity, they will be swept off the land. That has happened twice, at least, actually, three times. The antediluvian people were swept off in the flood, and the Garden of Eden was here. The Jaredites were swept off and the Nephites were swept off. And it's going to happen again unless we have a totally reverse situation from what we got going in the country today, see. Now that preparation then is to prepare for the gathering and the fulfilling of the Lord's covenants. And the gathering is the gathering of Israel to America. And the fulfilling of his covenants is bringing his people to Christ and to the Zion order and to the sacred endowments of the Spirit, to the cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night, so that Zion truly becomes Mount Zion. That's what the gathering, that's what the redemption of Israel is all about. It's not getting their bodies physically from one place to another. Now, in order to, to prepare then for that great gathering, you've got to have a cleansing of this land, because this is the land of Zion. And then you've got to have a refinement of the people of the Lord, because they are they who are foreappointed, the doctrine of election, to build Zion. And Zion is going to be built with judgment and her converts with righteousness. And not just to cleanse out the inactive, but to refine and purify the faithful so that their souls, through faith, through diligence, through challenge, through opposition, through adversity, will expand their reliance on the Lord will be perfected, and when they come out from the other end of the tunnel, they will be a righteous remnant ready now to establish the new Jerusalem, and then to the new Jerusalem, endowed with glory and power, the great gathering of Israel will take place. Now, when Nephi sees that great scenario, then he is also shown that there is a special apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ who was foreordained to write about these events. These events in the cleansing of Zion, these events in the cleansing not just of America now, but the cleansing of the whole earth. And so the book of Revelation then is a book explaining the cleansing of Zion and the cleansing of the whole earth and the establishment of God's kingdom on this earth for the millennial reign. Now, how much more important can a book be than one that deals with those subjects, see? And so Nephi then sees this apostle of the Lamb, 
And he says concerning him, the angel says concerning him, Behold, he shall see and write the remainder of these things. And then he clarifies that a little later in the statement, indicating that Nephi saw the same thing that John the Revelator saw, and that Nephi, while he was not permitted to write it, nevertheless saw the full vision which John would see, and that was a point of future for him in his time. And Nephi then writes in a measure the introduction, the preface. If you want to study the book of Revelation, where do you start? You start with 1 Nephi 14. Why? Because that introduces the thing and gives the orientation. And in that sense, then, we're dealing then with, with uh, uh, an inspired commentary and an inspired introduction to a heretofore very difficult to understand book that's been interpreted in about every different way that is humanly possible by uh, people from the beginning of the Christian era to the present time. And the key to the correct knowledge of that book now is in this sacred body in the Book of Mormon. Now with that as introduction, let me then turn to uh, the uh, Book of Revelation and let's see if we can meet uh, the challenge of analysis and uh, get focused in on this particular volume and see what it means. First of all, John gives to, and I'm going to skip the first three verse, the first three chapters. They deal with the seven churches in Asia Minor. They're very important, particularly the promises that are given to the faithful. Uh, but for want of time, I think it would be best if we just say, hey, they deal with the churches of that day and pass those first three chapters on by. And then we come to chapter 4, where you get right into the beginning now of the prophetic picture. And the first thing John sees, in, uh, as expressed now in chapter 4, one of the first, is the great goal and objective for the creation of this earth. He says, for example, in chapter 4, verse 6, And before the throne there was a sea of glass, like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts, full of eyes before and behind. Now he sees then this sea of glass, like unto crystal. Let me have you turn to the 15th chapter now, verse 2, where he comes back to this same subject, and he says this in chapter 15, verse 2. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over his number, uh, the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having harps of God. Now the prophet Joseph comes to our rescue on that one in section 100 and, uh, 30 of the Doctrine and Covenants, and uh, he tells us a few things about celestial life. He says, for example, uh, this earth in its sanctified and immortal state, verse 9, will be a Urim and Thummim to the inhabitants who dwell thereon, whereby all things pertaining to an inferior kingdom or all kingdoms of a lower order will be manifested to those who dwell on it, and this earth will be Christ. Now, with that in mind, let's turn to section 77, and maybe you can put uh, your thumb in section 77 for a while because we want to come back to it for a few clarifications. Uh, section 77 is an interesting revelation. It's a series of questions and answers, and they all pertain to the book of Revelation. And in this particular uh, question and answer series, the prophet then deals with this subject of the, uh, uh, of the sea of glass and indicates uh, what it is. Verse 1 of section 77, what is the sea of glass spoken of by John 4, chapter and 6th verse of the Revelation? 
And answer, it is the earth in its sanctified, immortal, and eternal state. So what does John see first of all? He sees the great objective for which the Lord uh, created this earth, the end purpose. And that is that the design now in pouring out the judgments that John sees and in doing the other things that John sees, the great design finally is ultimately to produce a celestialized earth. That's what he sees. And that celestialized earth is an orb likened to crystal mingled with fire, and that has reference to its glory. And it will be so infused with intelligence or the, the glory of God. And keep in mind that section 93 tells us, verse 36, the glory of God is intelligence. And you infuse that material of this earth with, with the intelligence or glory of God, and it becomes a Urim and Thummim. And it becomes a revelatory instrument so that you can look into it and uh, see things pertaining to an equivalent or, or a lower order of glory, see. And uh, this earth then will be Christ, and those who are celestial will dwell on it, and they will have that means then of uh, acquiring knowledge and understanding, and then they'll each have their own pocket-sized Urim and Thummim, as the Lord uh, of the Prophet points out in section 130, whereby things pertaining to a higher order of celestial orbs can be made manifest to each of those. And on that Urim and Thummim that they have will be a new name that no man knows, and so forth, see. All right, so according to the Prophet Joseph Smith's clarification, then, we're starting in the book of Revelation a great cosmic picture dealing with this earth. And that great cosmic picture, then, uh, commences opening up then with the goal and the objective that this earth then is to be sanctified and is to become a millennium. And then after the millennium, as John sees in chapter 20, then, then you'll have the final great battle of Gog and Magog, there being two such battles, one before the millennium and one after. And then he sees the new heaven and the new earth, and this then is the celestial state, and this is Revelation 21 and 22. And so the book of Revelation, then, is a great revelatory work concerning this earth and its ultimate destiny. And that's the main theme now that we want to follow. All right, now, another thing that we need to understand. Let's, for example, before we get to that, though, talk about these four beasts. And uh, some details now here in chapter 4 of the book of Revelation. Here... For example, in the fourth part of this chapter, and I'm just going to abbreviate, John sees <clears throat> John sees the throne of God. And then in verse 4, he says, Round about the throne were four and twenty elders, four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. And then he goes on to say, that he also sees then four beasts. We're down here, for example, uh, in verse 6, the latter part of it, in the midst of the throne, round about the throne, were four beasts, full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was likened to a lion. He goes on and describes them. Now let's turn to section 77 again. Let's pick up the prophet's clarification on this subject. In section 77, the question is asked now, uh, verse 2, what are we to understand by the four beasts spoken in the same verse? And then he answers, and he says, now they are figurative expressions used by the revelator John in describing heaven, the paradise of God, the happiness of man and of beasts and of creeping things and of the fowls of the air, that which is spiritual being in the likeness of that which is temporal and that which is temporal in the likeness of that which is spiritual, the spirit of man in the likeness of his person, also the spirit of beasts in the likeness uh, of their organized beings, see, and every creature which God hath created. Now, the question then is asked, are the four beasts limited to individual beasts, or are they representative of classes and orders? 
and he says they are limited to four individual beasts, which were, to, which were shown to John to represent the glory of the classes of beings in their destined order or sphere of creation and the enjoyment of their eternal felicity. The prophet Joseph Smith once took up this subject of the book of Revelation in comparison with the uh, book of Daniel. Daniel talks about figures of beasts, and there's the four great figures of beasts. And the prophet made it very clear that there's a difference between Daniel's use of beasts and John's use of beasts. Daniel uses the term figure of a beast, which is actually a representative thing, and it applies to beastly kingdoms here on the earth, which are degenerate and which then are vicious in their basic spirit, see. And in that sense, then, those four beasts represent the Babylonian king, the Medo-Persian, the greco Magian, the Roman, and so forth, see. And those are the four beasts. Now, when it comes to the book of Revelation, when it comes to the book of Revelation, John sees actual animals in the paradise of God. He sees actual animals there. Now, these animals are made figurative in the sense that there are things portrayed about them which depict some of the nature that they have. Uh, the Revelation says, for example, that the four beasts were, uh, were full of eyes before and behind. Now, the eyes are symbolic of light, intelligence, and that kind of thing. And the wings symbolic of the power to move and to act. And so while they're individual animals, they are figuratively portrayed to symbolize their nature. But we're talking about different creatures. Now, for example, here's the prophet Joseph Smith's statement. He says, I, saw, I suppose John saw beings there of a thousand forms that had been saved from 10,000 times 10,000 earths. Now, John sees the whole vision of the creations of Christ, and he sees the animal kingdom. And that's just simple. And in that animal kingdom on the worlds which Christ has created and redeems, John then apparently saw uh, 10,000 times 10,000 uh, uh, beasts sent from 10,000, 10,000 earths. He says, strange beasts, of which we have no conception, all might be seen in heaven. The grand secret, and keep this now as the central point, the grand secret was to show John what there was in heaven. I've always said, if there's not a cow there, I don't want to go there. I love milk that much. And I've got a good old mutt friend or two that I've had in life that were just as near and dear to my heart as a member of the family. And I hope I have that continued relationship in the resurrection, you see. And that's what Joseph is saying. The grand secret was to show John that there, what there was in heaven. John learned that God glorified himself by saving all that his hands had made. Whether beasts, fowls, fishes, or men, he will glorify himself in them. Now, realizing this, that there's a resurrection of animals, realizing that God is going to save everything that he creates and glorify it, he's going to do that, and that's his committed program, then John sees four great animals. And the prophet talks about those four great animals, and they represent the order of the animal kingdom in the enjoyment of their eternal felicity. Now, the prophet says this as he speaks of them. He says, God who made the beast could understand every language spoken by them. The four beasts were four of the most noble animals that had filled the measure of their creation and had been saved from other worlds, other worlds than this one. And that raises some interesting things that I don't have time to get to. He says, because they were perfect, they were like angels in their sphere. We are not told where they came from, that is, which world. And he says, and I do not know, but they were seen and heard by John 
praising and glorifying God. All right, now John then begins by seeing the throne of God. And around the throne of God he sees four and twenty elders. And the prophet clarifies that those four and twenty elders were actual persons. They had been saved from the seven churches that are spoken of in the first three chapters of Revelation. And they're made representative of all saved beings in the human family. And then he sees these four beasts, and they are made representative. And he sees the celestial earth, the glorified earth, like unto a sea of glass and fire. And this then typifies the celestial order of the future. Now can you begin to see what the meaning of John's revelation is all about? All right, now as he sees these, he sees, say, verse 9, and when the, those beasts, uh, uh, and when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat upon the throne who liveth forever and ever. See, now these aren't beastly systems like Daniel sees, which are beastly and make war against the kingdom of God. These are actual animals in the paradise of God that represent the creative processes as they pertain to the animal kingdom. And the twenty and four elders then represent the faithful saints who will be redeemed and the blessings given to them. All right, now as John then sees these things, then in verse 5 he sees a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel, he says, proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book. And he says, I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders said unto me, one of these four and twenty elders, Weep not. Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, and that's just another name for the Messiah or for Christ. The Root of Jesse, that's just another name for Christ in relation to his lineage in the flesh, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And uh, in that sense, then, the book is sealed with seven seals, and Christ then prevails and is worthy to open it. Now let's turn, for example, again back to section 77 and get the prophet's clarification on the subject before we move on. As he speaks on this subject, he says this. Uh, uh, let's go here to uh, verse uh, 6. What are we to understand by the book which John saw, which was sealed on the back with seven seals? We are to understand that it contains the revealed will, mysteries, and works of God, the hidden things of his economy concerning this earth during the 7,000 years of its continuance or its temporal existence. Now, the temporal existence began with the fall. The word temporal comes from the word temporary. And the temporal existence of the earth then begins uh, with the fall of Adam and Eve. Now we ask then, verse 7, what are we to understand by the seven seals with which it was sealed? And the prophet answers, we are to understand that the first seal contains the things of the first thousand years, and the second also, uh, the second thousand years, and so on to the seventh. He says, what are to understand by the four angels spoken of in the seventh chapter? We'll get to that one, getting ahead of myself here just a minute. All right, now the book then is sealed on the back with seven seals. Its content, its content then is a revelatory record of all that has gone on on this earth from the fall of Adam down through time. And each seal then the contents under each seal or within the book sealed by a given seal, the contents then deal with that particular 1,000 year period of time. Is that clear? All right, now, uh, 
Let's just say a word or two of clarification that's very important at this point in relation to that book and its seals. Sometimes people get the idea that uh, uh, those seals are opened at the beginning of each thousand years. Now, that's not true. Uh, and in that sense, then, they're sealed and they're all opened, uh, not in the thousand years where the events transpire, but they're opened in the latter days. They're opened in the latter days in such a way that when you finally get to the seventh seal and it's opened, that begins the year, the, the seventh thousand year from the time Adam fell down through then to the opening of that seal. And the six, first six seals are open preliminary to that, and, the, and they then are all within the sixth seal leading up to the opening of the seventh, and the seventh seal is on target. It's right there at the opening of the seventh uh, of the 7,000 year period. We got that? All right, now there is uh, <clears throat> another feature to this that we need to, to see. And uh, this other feature then relates to the opening of these seals. In John chapter, Revelation chapter 6, <clears throat> we see the opening of those seals, or the, the opening at least of the first six of those seals. And with the opening of those, the first six of those seals, then we see things portrayed in this chapter. When the first seal is opened, he sees a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him. And he went forth conquering and to conquer. When the second seal was opened, he writes, and there uh, I heard the second beast say, and keep in mind now, these animals, and they're from other worlds, are involved now in this great process. And so the second beast is heard to say, uh, come and see. And there went up out... <coughs> A red, another horse that was red, and power was given him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another, and there was given unto him a great sword. Now this beast is a tremendous military system, and power is given to take peace from the earth. Now when the third seal was open, he says, uh, I heard the third beast say, <clears throat> Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances. You know, these balances that deals with, with the desire for justice and equity, social justice, liberty, etc. Uh, had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, a measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see, thou hurt not the oil and the wine. Now those who are represented then by uh, the black horse are interested in, in justice, social justice, equity, and in survival, and uh, the necessities or the substances of life, okay? Now, he says, and then he had opened the fourth seal. I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked and beheld a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death. And hell followed after him, and power was given him unto him over a fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword, with hunger, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. And then he sees the fifth seal, and when he'd heard then, that saw it open, he says, I saw under the altar the souls of them that had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwelleth on the earth? And white robes were given to them symbolizing blessings, endowments, elevation in their status. White robes were given to them, 
And it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. In other words, let's let all the martyrs get taken care of, and then the Lord will come out in his judgment See, Meantime, he uh, pacified them, if you want to use that term, it's a little more than that. They were given white robes symbolizing the glory and the power and the things that came to them. And then he says, And I beheld, when he had opened the sixth seal, and I'm going to turn here to the inspired revision of the prophet Joseph Smith, who dealt with this in order to get you the more complete and accurate picture from the standpoint of Latter-day uh, Revelation. Uh, in relation now to the, to the uh, sixth seal then, beginning here, verse uh, uh, 12, he has this to say. And lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a, with a mighty wind. And the heavens were opened, as a scroll is opened, when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? All right, the sixth day then is the ordination, and I use that word meaningfully, not the fulfillment, the ordination of the second coming. Okay? Now let's go back and see if we can pick up the picture on this. Some people maintain that uh, these various figures associated with the opening of the seals represent actions and activities in the respective thousand-year period. So that the white horse and he that sat upon the white horse with the bow represents something that took place between the fall of Adam and 1,000 of the year of the world. And the red horse represents something that took place between 1,000 of the year of the world and the year 2000, which would include the flood, which took place somewhere around 1635 or so after Adam's, after Adam's fall, see. And then so on down. Now let me give you, and this is a rather popular clarification. This, however, disregards the clarification given by the prophet Joseph Smith. Now let me turn to his statement and let's see what he says about it. He's the person who called it the plainest book God ever caused to be written. He's the person like John the Revelator saw what John saw, and like the brother of Jared saw what the brother of Jared saw. And hence then, I think, may be qualified to make a clarification that's meaningful. Here in the teachings, page 290, he says this, John saw beasts that uh, had to do with, with things of the earth but not in past ages. Okay? The beast which John saw had to devour the inhabitants of the earth in days to come, future from John. And then he quotes, the prophet does, the book of Revelation, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw and beheld a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering unto conquer. Now is this in the first millennial period of this earth's temporal state, or is it after John the Revelator's time, according to Joseph Smith? He makes it very clear, does he not? And then he goes on, and there went out another horse that was red. And power was given him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth. 
and that they should kill one another, and there was given unto him a great sword. And then he says, now the book of Revelation is one of the plainest book God's ever caused to be written, and that's where the statement comes in. All right, so these things that happened when the seals were opened, when the first seal was opened and the white horse went forth, it has nothing directly to do with 1,000 years from Adam's fall to the, the first millennial period. It is that which is depicted when that seal is opened. And in that sense, then, the opening of the seals are made to reveal the sequence of events in the last days. I don't know whether you've picked that one up, but that's one of the best statements I've made all day long. The opening of the seals is made to reveal the sequence of events in the last days. All right? Uh, these seals are to be opened in the last days. And at the opening of each seal, then there are certain prophetic events take place. Now, are the contents of the seals revealed immediately upon their opening? And the answer is no. How do we know that? Well, we turn to section 88 of the Doctrine and Covenants. And here then, the Lord talks about the immediate events ushering in the millennial reign. And just for point of clarification, for those of you who are uh, students in these things and have delved into this, let me just say that the seven angels in the book of Revelation are not the same things as in the book of John, Revelation. Now, the seven angels in the, in, the, in the Doctrine and Covenants, section 88, are not the same as in the book of Revelation. Uh, if we have some time, I'd like to get into that. I don't know, but we better rush on. But John sees, then, these uh, seven angels that's immediately sound now as the second coming is ushered in. And uh, then after they sound once, they turn around and they sound again. Now, they're correlated with Revelation. They're correlated, but it's not the same thing. And then here in section 88, page, or verse 108, he says, uh, And then shall the first angel again sound his trump. Now, this is another group of angels it relates now to the events of the second coming, to what takes place. They sound, they get the events of the second coming in gear, and the second coming takes place, and then immediately after the second coming, then they blow their horns again. I know what it says. And then shall the first angel again sound his trump in the ears of all living, and reveal the secret acts of men and the mighty works of God in the first thousand years. Now here's when the contents of the sealed book are revealed. It's after Christ comes in his glory uh, and as a preparatory thing for that great task that the saints will perform when they judge the nations of the earth. And in order to ex exercise a righteous judgment at the beginning of the millennium, Zion will have been established, the millennial order, and the first item of business is to bring about a judgment of all men from Adam on down. And in order for that judgment to be made in righteousness, then that sealed book, the seals of which have been previously opened in the last days, that sealed book now has its contents revealed as this order of angels sound their trumps. And why so? So that the saints now who have the challenge of judging the world will have a basis, an intelligent basis to fulfill that challenge and that responsibility. And he goes on and says, And then shall the second angel uh, sound his trump and reveal the secret acts of men and the thoughts and intents of their hearts and the mighty works of God in the second thousand years, and so on until the seventh shall sound his trump. Now, let me just recapitulate a minute here. John sees a book. It has uh, uh, seven seals on the back. The contents under each of these seals is a revelatory record of the human family, including the secret thoughts of their hearts for the various 
successive thousand-year periods from the fall of Adam down to the opening of the seventh seal. You see that? That's what it contains. Now, as those seals are opened, then John sees prophetic events. The white horse represents something that's going to take place on earth when the first seal is opened. The red horse represents something that's going to take place on earth in the way of judgments, in the way of the cleansing of Zion, in the way of the cleansing of the earth when the second seal is opened, and so on down through. See, there's, and actually there's four horses. These are the, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. You see that? And uh, they represent then four major uh, eras of judgment leading up to the final cleansing of the earth. Now, before we get into the identity of each of these animals, let me turn to another statement by the prophet Joseph Smith for some clarification. And I have reference now to section 87 of the Doctrine and Covenants, which is called the Prophecy on War. So let's just say a few words about this. Then we'll come back to the book of Revelation and see if we can pick up the theme with the Prophet Joseph's clarification as a basis. Now, section 87 of the Doctrine and Covenants was given Christmas Day, December the 25th, 1832. And uh, many people, as they read this, say, hey, this is a prophecy of the Civil War. Now, let me back up and say, not quite so. Uh, this is too narrow a view. This is not merely a prophecy of the Civil War. Note, for example, the opening verse. Verily, thus saith the Lord, concerning the wars, and it's plural, it's not a war, concerning the wars that will shortly come to pass beginning at the rebellion of South Carolina, which will eventually terminate in the death and misery of many souls. And the time will come when war will be poured out upon all nations, beginning at this place. All right, now what's the prophecy and war about? Let me give you the prophet Joseph Smith's own words on it. This is section 130 of the Doctrine and Covenants where a few years later then he comes back to this same subject and, and draws information and makes clarification uh, on uh, the prophecy and war. In verse 12 he says, I prophesy in the name of the Lord God that the commencement of the difficulties which would cause much, much bloodshed previous to the coming of the Son of Man. Now do you get the scope of things? It's not a prophecy about the Civil War. It's a prophecy about this era of judgment that we call the last days that will exist, transpire, take place previous to the coming of the Son of Man. He says, This a voice declared to me while I was praying earnestly on the subject, December 25th, 1832. What's the date of the prophecy on war now? December 25th, 1832. See? And uh, in that sense, then, he clarifies that the prophecy on war, then, is a statement of an overview of the judgments that will come, that will finally lead up, as the prophecy says, to that time when the consumption decreed hath made a full end of all nations. Now, that's what it's talking about, you see. All right, now, within that scope of prophetic vision, let's take the prophecy on war just for a minute, and we'll carefully or quickly at least dissect it a little bit. We could talk all evening on it, but we don't have the time. We've only got 27 hours in this program and we're running out. All right, so, so we uh, will just briefly then dissect uh, this statement. Now the prophecy then begins with a statement about the American Civil War, and it makes it clear that the American Civil War is the beginning of an era of warfare. Now, if you've studied uh, Arnold J. Toynbee's work on, on, uh, on history and so forth, and if you've studied other military works then in regard to the, the military program of the latter day, 
you'll find that they're all united in saying that the American Civil War is the beginning of that kind of war that we call total war. And it's also the beginning of mechanized war, where you have the first ironclad uh, ships. And it's also the beginning then of uh, uh, other kinds of things. Eli Whitney not only invented uh, uh, the cotton gin, he invented mass production. And the North put that principle into operation and outproduced the South in, in economic goods and gained strength and power to overcome the South. So the American Civil War is literally the beginning of a whole new ball game of conflict. And that's what the Lord says here. He says, For behold, the southern states, verse 3, will be divided against the northern states, and the southern states will call on other nations, even the nation of Great Britain. Now this the southern states did, and Great Britain became involved in our internal affairs, and it cost them $15,500,000 in the Geneva Arbitration of 1870 when the thing was finally cleared up. See. Now, if I were doing this revelation, I'd put a new paragraph right there, because there's the beginning of a new idea. All right? It begins this new idea and says, and they, now the antecedent to they is Great Britain, and they shall also call upon other nations in order to defend themselves against other nations. And then, not till then, not in the Civil War, but then, when Great Britain calls on other nations to form a coalition against other nations, and this was the Allied and the Associated Powers with Great Britain in 1909 calling upon other nations against the central powers of Austria, Hungary, Bulgaria, etc., etc., then, then, he says, war shall be poured out upon all nations. Now, see, after the Civil War in America, then the next major conflict was the Franco-Prussian War of 1870. And that was an interesting war because prior to that, Germany had existed as just a whole multitude of independent states, weak by lack of organization. But this guy Bismarck came along with the idea of uniting the German states and establishing them on the Prussian militaristic program of, of saber-rattling which he was successful in doing, and the, the catalyst that brought the German states together was the Franco-Prussian War, and he had prepared them beforehand by training them militarily and got some new modern weapons called a needle gun that was more efficient than anything that France had. And meanwhile, France was enjoying herself in all her dissipation with great national pride. And when Bismarck then provoked France then to declare war on Germany, and he did this with calculated intent. France accommodated him, and the new German nation trounced the socks off of them. And in Europe then, Germany emerged as the dominant nation of the earth, built on the cosmic system of military might and power of saber-rattling, and as a result of that, there began to develop a network of secret combinations in which one nation would say to another, if you are attacked by that nation, we commit ourselves to come into the conflict. And that system of secret alliances was built up gradually. And then in about the 1894 period of time, you see a tremendous thrust in Europe uh, in the arms race. And finally, in 1909, Great Britain called upon other nations to defend herself against these other nations. And by then, this secret network had divided the nations of Europe into two opposing camps. And when they were thus divided into two opposing camps, as all it took was a little incident for one nation to go to war against the other. And as a result, then one nation after another was dragged into that. For America, Wilson ran on the ticket of keeping us out of the war. But B. H. Roberts, an LDS scholar, in the summer of 8, 1914, wrote a little article which was published on the prophecy on war, in which he quotes this statement, when Great Britain calls upon other nations to defend herself against other nations, then war will be poured out upon all nations. On all nations. And Brother Roberts then says, hey, they have called upon other nations, and uh, 
this incident now that is underway there is not going to be the end of it. One nation will be dragged into this after another until this becomes global in its impact. And so war was poured out upon all nations. Okay? Now that's the second thing. You first of all have the American scene. And then you have uh, the scene shift to, to uh, Great Britain. And then you have the scene shift from there. And note, it doesn't say much about World War I versus World War II or even include World War II. And the reason for that is that really it was just a little bit like the Jaredites. They didn't declare any peace. Shiz and Coriantumr just leaned on their swords and looked at each other until they got enough energy to swat each other again. And uh, the same kind of thing happened nationally. We were involved in another arms race before they ever got the ink on the armistice, and we used to call it Armistice Day. But then we saw the hypocrisy of it and we changed it to what? The Veterans Day. Why? Because there was no armistice. You see that? You're introducing an era of world war and world conflict. And then the prophecy of war goes on down. Now this is all related to the sixth chapter of the book of Revelation. Let me just put it this way. Revelation chapter 6, 1 Nephi chapter 14, and the DNC section 87 all deal with the same subject and the same prophetic picture. Now that's an important point. They all deal. Nephi sees it. He writes it in his manner, holding back, saying, I've seen it, uh, talking about wars being poured out and so forth. And uh, the book of Revelation then sees it. And now here the prophecy on war. Now let's get the picture then from here, then we'll go back. Now in verse 4, following now in sequence, it shall come to pass after many days. Many days after what? Well, you can take two possibilities. Many days after the rebellion of South Carolina. Or you can take the other alternative or choice. Many days after war has been poured out upon all nations. Now, if you study this out carefully, you'll find that the general tenor of thought is that this is in sequence. And so we're talking then about many days after world war uh, has plagued the world with the outbreak of war when Great Britain calls upon other nations to defend herself again. Now, many days after that, slaves shall rise against their masters, who shall be marshaled and disciplined for war. Now, um, many days, gets us clear on down through a ways, and slaves shall rise against their masters. I've seen articles written on the prophecy and war that try to bring the American slaves who joined the Civil War into the picture and have them fulfill this. Do that. That's wrenching the scriptures. That's taking them out of context. See, you've got to say, okay, we're going to... We first have American Civil War, and then we have Great Britain calling on other nations in the era of World War. And then many days after that, then you have slaves rise against their masters, and their masters now are marshaled and disciplined for war. They're, they're a militaristic program, and slaves revolt against them. And then note in verse 5, And it should come to pass also, now the word also extends the statement in verse 4, saying that the kind of thing you're talking about in verse 4 is going to take place in another setting with another group. Now it should come to pass also that the remnants who are left of the land will marshal themselves and become exceedingly angry and shall vex the Gentiles with the four vexation. Now we know from the Book of Mormon what verse 5 is all about. We know what it is when the remnants who are left of the land, and they're the remnants then of Jacob on this land and so forth, and how they pay Indian and cowboy instead of cowboy and Indian. Uh, and they do so with the Gentiles, and they go through among the Gentiles like a lion in the beasts of the forest and like a lung, young lion in the midst of, of a flock of sheep, see. And they are exceedingly angry, and they vex the Gentiles with a sore vexation. Now, let's come down to our day. What is the great military power of the earth? that dominates, in the sense of uh, uh, arbitrary power, many, many people, which military power actually 
is marshaled and disciplined for war. Which one is it? Okay, you've got the picture there. It's the communist bloc and so forth, see. And who are the slaves? All right, they're those people who are under the dominance of that mighty military power. Isn't that clear? Okay. And they're going to rise against their masters. Now, when do they do that? Okay, you got it again. The whole beginning scenario is that the Gentile order in America here becomes violently turbulent. And uh, we're trying to save the Constitution as a batch of Latter-day Saints. And you have the rise of the strong man to stabilize things in America. He doesn't think very much of Mormons. And you have a beginning era of warfare against Zion. And uh, this then is followed by the coming of the Assyrian to this land. And when the military power of the Assyrian who is that great northern army spoken of in Joel chapter 2, of which Moroni gives some clarifications. When that happens, then, uh, and the military might of that system is over here, if you were a freedom lover in Poland or in Hungary, what would you do? You will have mass uprising. Slaves will rise against their masters, okay? And what will that cause? What kind of effect will that have? It will have this kind of effect. Those soldiers here will say, hey, we've got something closer to home we've got to take care of. And they will withdraw. And we then, with the power we can muster, and with the power of the Lord, keep in mind as we discussed here the other evening, Isaiah says that the Assyrian will be driven back by the power of the anointing. And so it will be a combined situation. And this land, which will have been disciplined and uh, will have been cleansed by that Assyrian, where the Lord says, I will send the Assyrian against a hypocritical nation, and he will cleanse and so forth. This land, then having been cleansed, will be left relatively free. And then what will happen? Well, the Indian people will be called by the Lord. They will band together. They will be exceedingly angry. They will vex the Gentiles with a sore vexation. Meantime, what do the Latter-day Saints do? They get on the stick. The, the church has been humbled, and the church has been cleansed, and Zion has been refined. And the remnant that Isaiah talks about over and over and over again that the Book of Mormon just talks about, we discussed here... Uh, earlier in, in the Isaiah prophecy, see, then uh, that remnant that has been cleansed and sanctified, this will be the group of people who then will redeem Jackson County. You see that? And they'll build up that order, and they'll save the Constitution, not in Washington, D.C., perpetuating the Gentile order. The times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. They were fulfilled in 1967. Jesus gives us a clue in, in Luke chapter, thir uh, chapter 21. He says, for example, there that Jerusalem shall be trodden down by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Now, when did Jerusalem cease to be trodden down by the Gentiles? It began in 48 with the war there, and then there was this uh, six-day war in 67. At the time of that war, I was in Las Vegas, not for reasons that many Latter-day Saints go there, but uh, I was there on an education week, and I was discussing the last days. And you know, this building would have held everyone who wanted to come because, hey, something's going on in Jerusalem. And we had people filling here and sticking their heads in the door and listening outside and, and carrying messages on through to get to the, what I was saying to everybody who was congregated around. They thought Armageddon was on its way, and they were ready to repent. <laughs> and they says, Brother Andrews, is this Armageddon? I says, no, this is not Armageddon. I says, but I'll tell you what will happen. The Jews are going to come out on top on this. And I says, and I'll tell you what else will happen. They're going to get possession of Mount Moriah. Now, you go home and write that down. And so the Jews, after fighting for six days, they don't believe in doing a seven-day job, uh, 
mopped the thing up, and they gained possession then not only of Jerusalem, of Mount Moriah, which is the core thing, and Jerusalem ceased to be trodden down of the Gentiles. And the times of the Gentiles were officially fulfilled. Well, if I had time, I'd like to discuss that with you as to how it's the rationale, because we're still around, you see that. Now, there's reason for still being around, and I, I don't have time to get into that. You'll just have to take that one on faith. All right, and so he sees then in the book of Revelation, he sees then the American Civil War, he sees the, he sees the, uh, the coming of World War, he sees slaves rise against their masters, and he sees the latter-day remnant. And then he doesn't say anything more specifically, he just says this, and it should come to pass, and, and thus with the sword and by bloodshed the inhabitants of the earth shall mourn, and with famine and plague and earthquake and thunder of heaven and the fierce and vivid lightning also shall the inhabitants of the earth be made to feel the wrath and indignation and chastening hand of an almighty God until the consumption decree doth made a full end of all nations. He doesn't give any specific details more than that, see. All right, but those are enough. John, Revelation chapter 6 does the same thing. In John's chapter 6, overview of events in the last days, he mentions four things, the white horse, the red horse, the black horse, the pale horse. And these four events are correlated with the prophecy on war. The white horse, for example, is America. And the one who sits on the white horse has a bow and goes forth conquering unto conquer. And uh, the white horse then uh, represents the beginning of the era of warfare against Zion. And in that sense, then, the figure of the bow is important, at least I feel so, and let me suggest it to you, and you can think what you want to on it. We've had some interesting skirmishes in America recently. We had the thing called Granada, where they went in. We had the Libyan thing. We had the Persian Gulf then. And in each instance, it is, as it were, we just sent a bow, bombed in, and pulled back. The white horse pulled back and unleashed a military action against a particular thing in this part of the area, see. And they did that in Granada, they did that in Libya, they did that in the Persian Gulf, and we just might have to do it some more, see. The white horse is doing his thing. The first seal has been opened. That's essentially what that would say, if that's right. You see that? All right, now, the red horse, then. What is the red horse? What does John say? John says in relation to the red horse, let me read it. The power was given him that sat upon it to take peace from the earth, and there was given unto him a great sword. This is a military power. Now, when the white horse gets through doing its thing, and the American economy, if we don't get some sanity in our head, goes under, and the latter-day Assyrian comes to this hypocritical nation, peace will be taken from the earth. Power was given him to take peace from the earth, and it was given unto him a great sword. Okay? Now, in the prophecy in war, after you deal then with the masters, you've got to deal with the slaves, the slaves who rise against their masters. And so John sees then I heard a third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances. The slaves are interested in what? Justice. And they're also interested in sustenance. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts saying, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the oil or the wine. And then he sees the fourth beast. And he opened the fourth seal, I heard the, the voice of the fourth beast saying, Come and see. And I looked, and I beheld a pale horse, and the name that sat on him, and his name that sat on him was Death, and Hell followed after. And power was given to him over a fourth part of the earth. 
Now, North and South America constitute a fourth part of the earth. And the pale horse has to do with the remnant, and he's going to do something with pale faces, <coughs> if I can put it that way. And he that rode the pale horse is death. The remnant is becoming, they're going to become exceedingly angry. They're going to vex the Gentiles with a sore vexation. And those whom they kill, being corrupt, instead of going to the paradise of God, will be thrust down to hell. And so he who sat on the pale horse is death, and hell followed after them. You see that? Now, let me just suggest that. You go home and pray about it and see what the Lord says to you. And then, on that basis, then, then the next seal is a focus on the martyrs. And these martyrs go clear back to Jesus and to the early saints and uh, to those that Bloody Mary took care of in uh, the 1500s, from 1553 to 1558, while she reigned in England, and others then and the Latter-day Saints who have given their lives. And they cry from under the altar, and they say, Hey, what's this business about not having any justice? You're a god of justice. And why don't you avenge us then of what's happened? And the Lord then will pacify them. They will be given robes of righteousness and blessed and consoled and told, look, before this is done, there are some other martyrs that have got to join you, and we'll just wait till all of you get together, and then we'll take care of it, see? All right? So that's the fifth seal. Now, the sixth seal, then, when it's opened, is the ordination of the second coming. Now, Christ does not come in the sixth seal or at the end of the sixth seal. We've got a bunch of literature out that has never really done their homework in relation, then, to the prophetic events. Let me turn, for example, to section 77 again, and let's go back and pick up the picture from the prophet Joseph Smith. He's talking now here about the events to take place as depicted in Revelation chapter 8 and 9. Now, let me just fill you in beforehand. Revelation chapter 6 is an overview of the prophetic events of the last days, beginning then with the warfare against Zion, centering on the white horse, running it on through, and the sixth seal is the ordination of the second coming. And I emphasize the word ordination. Okay? Chapter 7 is a special spotlight scene, and we'll get to that after the break that deals now with the calling of the 144,000 great high priests of the Holy Order, whose mission it will be to gather people into the Church of the Firstborn, the sanctified Church, the Church prepared for the second coming of Christ. It's this Church that's going to be caught up to meet Christ, and the 144,000 have that ministry. And then they do their work. They do their work in a period of 21 months, 21 years plus. After the opening of the seventh seal, there's, there is silence in heaven, not on earth, in heaven, for the space of one half hour, or about, it says, one half hour. One half hour would put it uh, in the Lord's time, 21 years. About indicates it can be a little more than that, you see. And it's during that period of time when the heavens look on with awe and silence that the 144,000 go forth in the earth, their plagues, their judgments, and their ministry is to bring people into the church of the firstborn. And then, immediately after that, the great cleansing plagues begin to take place. And there are seven of them, and they're spoken of in the 8th and the ninth chapter of the book of Revelation. And let's read now what the prophet Joseph has to say about that. He says, when will, uh, 
when are the things to be accomplished which are written in the ninth chapter of Revelation? Now, well, let's the eighth chapter, he's verse 12, mentioned in the eighth. Well, his answer then basically is this. He says, they are to be accomplished after the opening of the seventh seal before the coming of Christ. Now, is Christ going to come at the opening of the seventh seal in his great world appearance? And the answer is no. Why? Because these last great plagues and judgments that cleanse the wicked from the earth, and this is merely the parable of the wheat and the tares, the 144,000 gather the wheat. They gather them into the church of the firstborn. That's the bin. And they organize them according to the holy order as the Lord revealed to Joseph Smith in section 86 of the Doctrine and Covenants. And then when they're gathered in, and uh, the Lord comes to his temple, and the great Adam on Diamond Council is held in connection with that great gathering and its co accomplishment, then the great plagues are poured out, and the wicked are cleansed from the earth. And this is spoken of, then, in Revelation chapter 8 and Revelation chapter 9. You see that? And in that sense, then, the prophet says, these things are to be accomplished after the opening of the seventh seal before the coming of Christ. So Christ doesn't come at the opening of the seventh seal. There's a half hour of silence, and then there's plagues, and that's under the sixth plague that the wicked are gathered to Jerusalem for the great abomination of desolation. And the last stage of that period of things is three and a half years. There's a longer, longer period that leads into it, but the last stage of it will be a three and a half year period of time. And then you'll have after it then the opening of the great seventh plague as Christ stands then on the Mount of Olives and the wicked are cleansed. But Christ doesn't come then until sometime way after the opening of the seventh seal. You see that? Now when people put Adam on Diamond before the year 2000, they don't know the prophetic picture. When they put Christ coming to his temple before the year 2000, they don't know what they're doing. Now we've got some literature out and Somehow someone got one to me somewhere that's uh, all geared up with those great events in the three and a half years now somewhere in the 90s, and it's just a bunch of garbage. Leave it alone. Well, read it. If you can't separate the wheat from the chaff, go ahead and eat the chaff. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> now, in that sense then, uh, let's just conclude here, and then we'll take a little break. Uh, the book of Revelation, instead of one great chronological event, one after another, is actually a series of spotlights on the last days. John sees, for example, the four beasts and the elders. He sees the book, and that gives you orientation. He's seen the new heaven and the new earth. And then in Revelation chapter 6, he sees an overview. He sees the four beasts. He sees the wailings of the martyrs, and then he sees the second coming ordained under the sixth seal, but fulfilled in the seventh. It's like the, it's like the creation. Man was ordained to be placed on earth on the sixth day. He was placed on earth in actual fact on the seventh day. Go read, for example, the book of Abraham and the book of Moses. The book of Abraham in particular uh, makes it very, very clear that they came down to place man on earth. And then the sixth day terminates, and the seventh day ordained. But man is ordained to be put on earth in the sixth day, and is fulfilled in the seventh. Similarly, then you have the same kind of a situation. The second coming is ordained under the sixth seal, but it's fulfilled under the seventh seal. And then after that, then John sees this special spotlight of the 144,000. And then he sees chapter 8 and 9, which is the plagues. And then he sees chapter 10, which is a spotlight on himself, John the Revelator, with the little book that he's given, which is his ministry to gather the tribes of Israel. And then he sees another spotlight, and this is on the Jerusalem scene, the two prophets that are raised up in uh, uh, the period when the nations of the earth gather against Jerusalem in the great abomination of desolation. And then he sees chapter 12, and this is one of the most meaningful chapters. He sees the war in heaven 
and it's a type and shadow of the warfare against Zion on earth. And we want to get to that, particularly from the inspired revision of the book of Revelation. And then he sees chapter 13, which is a portrayal of the two great beasts that make war, uh, Babylon and the Assyrian, or the little horn, or the northern army. You see that? Then he sees chapter 14. And chapter 14 then gives us the account of the angel flying through the midst of heaven to restore the gospel. And it seems like it's all out of kilter. I mean, after all, you've talked about the two prophets in chapter 11, and you've talked about the two great powers in chapter, in, in chapter 13, and then chapter 14 opens up, and you say that has to do with the restoration of the gospel. Clear back here before the book of Revelation even gets into gear to be fulfilled. You see that? Now, why? Well, you hold on to that when there's a real reason why, and it's a very beautiful one, and we'll get to it. But right now, let's take a breather. The Lord bless us to take advantage of this if you can.